If you gave God a yes, then you should never be okay with living a lackluster life hidden in obscurity. In order to rise to the stature of a kingdom influencer, you need the power of God at work within you. This God-given power makes you irresistible, a head turner, where everything you do is effective. In order to walk in the power, you have to be prepared to do uncommon things and live an uncommon life. Allow this dunamis power to find expression in you. Allow the Holy Spirit to whisper to your spirit and enable you to do the things you are destined to do. So I encourage you to show up in this world, own your space of power, and know that through God, you have been empowered from on high. Welcome back to part two of our series on power. I think everyone wants power, everyone needs power. We live in a society full of people that feel powerless, but those people should not include you. In our text today from the book of Ephesians chapter one, verse 15 to 21, it says, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above principalities and powers and mights and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. We're using this scripture because it talks about power. And today I want to speak on a simple topic. It's all Greek to me, literally. That's the name of the topic. It's all Greek to me. The word power, our English language is kind of restricted because it doesn't give us the breadth and the depth that many other languages give to give us more color and texture to a word, the word power. When people say, I want to be powerful, or you're powerful, or I've got power, does it all have the same meaning? And so I wanted to go to the Greek to extrapolate to unearth, to excavate the different levels and dimensions, the different variations of that one word power. Before we get into the over 150 dimensions of power that we're going to teach you on, one by one, line by line, I wanted to give you an understanding of this word power. Proverbs 4 and 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing, and therefore, Get wisdom, and with all that getting, get an, uh, get an understanding. And so it's important that we have understanding. And by the way, uh, the power to understand is also a dimension of power, but we'll get uh, to that in a minute, and we'll get to that later on when we get to the U's. So we're going to go all the way from A to Z when it comes to the different dimensions of power. So you don't wanna miss this teaching. You don't wanna miss the series. It's going to be probably one of the longest series I'm ever gonna teach. And I'm gonna go line by line, precept upon precept, and look at all the dimensions of power that is given to us. And then you would really, really begin to understand that you are indeed fearfully and wonderfully made. Now there are nine Greek words for power, and seven of those Greek words are contained in the text that we just read. So there is dunamis, dunamis. This is kinetic energy. There is kratos. Another word for kratos is vigor. There is another word, another Greek word, is kuritatos, which is translated rulership, 
or dominion. As kus is force, anergon is translated effectiveness, exousia is translated authority, arc or arche is translated magistrate or chain of authority, chain of authority. All of those is contained in the text that we read, Ephesians 1, 19 to 21. But there is two more, didomai, which is translated ability out of Revelations 13, uh, 14 and 15. And then magliotes, magliotes. And that means magnificence. And you can find that Greek word expressed uh, and translated mighty power or magnificent from out of Luke 9, 43. But in our text, we are introduced to those seven, seven of those Greek words. And I wanna run through them so that you can understand how powerful scriptures are. It's easy to look at the English word and assume that we really do understand what a sentence mean or even what a paragraph or what a verse means. But when you go into the Greek, and the Greek or the New Testament was written in Greek, the Old Testament, of course, in Hebrews, and because in Hebrew, because we are actually talking uh, to you about power from out of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 21, we know that it's Greek. Paul, introducing us to the whole aspect of power, he, he begins to pray. And he says, wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So he's giving thanks, his uh, attitude of gratitude. And then he is praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling? What is the, of, is the riches of his glory of the inheritance in the same? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Now, that word, the greatness of his power, that word power is dunamis. And it's actually kinetic energy. Now, how do I explain kinetic energy? Kinetic energy is actually what people feel in the presence of another person that makes it impossible to, to be controlled. So the person who walks in a room that has this kinetic energy, that usually means that you can't control that person and other people feel it. It's, 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 they feel the presence of the person. We call it aura, but it, it's incredible power. It's this power that you know this person needs to be taken serious. It makes it impossible for them to be controlled by other people, external forces. This power is behind great leaders who have incredible influence. And I think of Hitler, and he was able to say, okay, this world should not have anyone in it that does not have blue eyes and blonde hair. However, Hitler himself had dark eyes and black hair. And it's interesting because, I mean, you could see with your eyes how what he was saying really didn't make sense. And he really should, should have been one of the ones that uh, didn't live. Not that I espouse to killing someone because of the color of their skin or because of their ethnicity. But you can see he had incredible influence, incredible power. He had incredible persuasion, and it made him irresistible. It's what happens when a person walks in that room and the heads turn. We talk about a person having a presence or a person having aura uh, that is so compelling that it's impossible for other people to ignore them. And this is what that word dunamis, when God said, I give you dunamis, it means that you are going to be a head turner. It means that you will influence individuals who may not even like your message, who may not even like Christians. But if God says that you are going to be the head and not the tail, first and not last, 
It's going to take dunamis. It's going to take that amount of power to occupy in that position of influence. And God is bringing us into new positions of influence, new realms of power, and that, that, that kinesthetic power comes from the Greek word dunamis. Luke chapter 2, 52 gives us an example of that. It says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and watch this, and favor with God and man. So he had influence. He had influence with God. He had influence with man. He had influence in, in, in spiritual things, in sp influence in natural things. He was just powerful. He had that dunamis. He had that kinetic energy that when he walked in the room, heads turned. When he talked at the age of 12, with individuals that would have had what would be equivalent to several PhDs, he's only 12, and he, he, he captures their attention. Wherever he walked, he had the attention of man. He goes into industries, and he says, follow me, I'll make you fishes of man. 12 businessmen just leaves everything. They leave their job. They leave their businesses. They leave spheres of influence to follow him. Wherever he went, he had that dunamis, that kinetic energy. And I'm using the word kinetic energy not to diminish the fact that he was God in the flesh, but to be able to really emphasize this Greek word to give you a greater understanding. There are some people that walk in a room and they become a wallflower. Nobody notices them. But then there are other people that walk in the room and everybody notices them. Everybody wants to know who they are. Everybody wants to have photo ops with them. And if God is going to use you in this season, you cannot be hidden in obscurity. God is going to give you the dunamis. It's going to give you the presence, the power, and it's going to be his presence on you. This is not just the anointing, but it's the pure presence of God. You are going to be able to shift environments and atmosphere because you're going to be the carrier of God's glory and the carrier of God's anointing, and you are going to be endued with favor. You're going to be endued with this power that makes you irresistible. The Bible goes on to say this is towards us who believes according to the working. Go back to the scripture. According to the working. And this word working is energon. It means the effectiveness, energon, the effectiveness of the power of God according to the working of his might. So that word working is energon. The word might is vigorous out of which we get the English word vigorous. Um, it means that you've got vim, you've got vigor, you've got energy. So energon is effectiveness. The scripture from out of Ephesians 3, 7 to 12, speaks of energon and gives us an understanding of it as Paul continues to paint the picture of how powerful we are because we are in Christ. He says in Ephesians 3, 7 to 12, if you would go there with me, please, Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Is this grace given that I should preach amongst the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath he hid in God who created all things by Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith in him. So what he's simply saying that you've got so much energon that everything that you do will be effective. So it means that, that your work will be effective. Your preaching will be effective. It means that your debate will be effective. Your leadership will be effective. Your business will be effective. Your ministry will be effective. In, in, in other words, this power, this energon brings about effect 
effectiveness in everything that you do. Nothing that you do is going to fall flat. Right behind there, there's this word, mighty, kratos. It means vigorous. And it's important for us to know that this means, means that we've got vigor, that we're not strolling through life. This is the, the power, according to his mighty power. Now, this is another Greek word, according to his mighty, vigorous, according to his mighty power, is cuss. So now you're seeing a different variation of this word power. And this word is cuss means force. Now, when you, when, when you go to Genesis 8 to 10, we, we hear of people being a force to be reckoned with. He is a force to be reckoned with. She is a force to be reckoned with. But when you read the book of Genesis 10, until you get to verse number 8, it's talking about this person beget that person, this person beget that person, this person beget that person, and it goes straight down, giving the genealogy and the lineage of certain individuals until you get to Cush. And something interesting happens in verse number 8. If you go to Genesis 10, verse number 8 to 10, Cush just jettisons out amongst individuals that's going through life as, as normal. They're, they're getting married, they're having children, they're being employed, they're getting married, they're having children, they fall in love, they go to celebrations. It, it's just life as normal. Then all of a sudden, Cush jettisons out amongst all the people that are going through life normal. And then after you hear about Cush, then it goes back, this person has that person, this person um, has this child and that child. And I don't want you to be amongst the clutter of the common within your community and with your, in your industry that's doing business as usual. Just hanging out with the status quo and like I say, the, the clutter of the common. But in order to see an uncommon or experience an uncommon life, You've got to be prepared to do uncommon things. And that's why kush is important as we talk about this one Greek word, iskos, power. Verse number eight, and kush begat Nimrod. And he began to be mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Iraq and Akkad and Kalna and the land in the land of Shinar. Now, what does that mean? This is this, this man, he was so powerful and so forceful that he was able to build kingdoms while people were just building families and communities. This is that word iskas, the word power. It's the force that brings about results. Psalm 82, verse 1, if you would go there with me, please, it'll give you further understanding of this Greek word power. God standing in the congregation of the mighty, he judges amongst the gods, small g. How long will you just unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, Selah? Defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. This will go on and um, it, within this, in the text. But what God is saying here, you are powerful but you're acting powerless. I created you in my image after my likeness. I mean, you know, two days ago, I was just meditating and God gave me this amazing revelation by asking me a question. He said, Cindy, when you look at me, what's wrong with me? I said, nothing. What's broken about me? Nothing. What needs to be fixed about me? Nothing. And then he said to me, Cindy, why do you think that something is broken and something needs to be fixed in your life? What, you are made in my image, made after my likeness. You are a masterpiece because you're a piece of the master. 
And if nothing is broken and nothing is wrong with me, nothing is broken and nothing is wrong with you. Now, we're not talking about our behavior that we can adjust. We're not talking about habits that we can eliminate by adopting new habits. I'm talking about your essence, my essence at the core of me. And when we talk about um, the next best version of ourselves, the Bible said that we are being changed into the image. In other words, my life cannot get any worse than what it is. I'm gonna get better and stronger, growing from faith to faith, and so it is with you. When you look at your life, do not allow the enemy to convince you that you are inherently broken. The Bible said that he created you in his image and after his likeness, you are not flawed, baby. You are fabulous. And this is that power, the core of you. When we talk about self-mastery, self-mastery is carving out a path to the next best version of yourself. And every iteration of who you're gonna be, your 10 year old, your 11 year old, your 15 year old, your 20 year old, your 30 year old, every version of yourself is already on the inside of you. I think of the story within the book of Genesis that, that, that uh, gives us a, a picture of Jacob who received a revelation that he was a prince, he, he was gonna have favor with, with, with God and man, and, 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 and a, every prince turns into a king, and a king um, operates through the law of dominion. And so when we think about the whole idea of you and I having dominion, the first level of dominion is to have dominion over what you are not. You are not the tail, you're the head, you are not Last, you are first. You are the highest expression of, of divine genius and intelligence manifested in your personhood, in my personhood, both of us given as a gift to humanity. And if you can just stop for a while and just meditate on it. And let me ask you the question. If you are created in the image and after the likeness of God, if nothing is wrong with God, nothing's broken with God, nothing needs to be fixed with God, and I want you to answer me, what is wrong with you? What is broken about you? What needs to be fixed about you? And I'm talking about your essence. Once you know your identity, who you are, you'll be able to show up in this world unapologetically strong, and you will make a difference in this world. And this is why this, this one word, power, I give you power. It's important for us to understand how powerful we are. We are not victims of circumstances. We are not products of our environment. In fact, we are creators of the environment. We are not the product of an environment. Life is not happening to you, it's happening for you because it gives you the ability and the opportunity even through the crises and problems that confront us, they all become mirrors that we can look on the inside of us to see how powerful we really are and the great amount of potential and ability that's hidden on the inside. The Bible said we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You have been ordained by God to be alive in this season, in this generation, in this dispensation, to be alive for such a time as this, because of what you are carrying. You cannot afford in this season not to allow that power to come out, to um, explore your truth. People say, oh, I'm just gonna tell my truth. So we all wanna live our truth, we all wanna tell our truth. But once you find out it's the truth about your greatness, it's the truth about your personality, it's the truth about your potential, it's the truth about your purpose, it's the truth about your assignment. Most people say, oh, I'm just want, I just wanna tell my truth, and it's their testimony about all the bad things that happened to them. Uh, yes, bad things happen to people, not because they're inherently bad, it's just how life is. You've got good people in the earth, bad people in the earth, 
and bad people will do bad things, but you don't ever have to be a victim of circumstances and you never have to be one of them. You are powerful. Paul wanted us to know as he began to talk about the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that you may know the, how, how mighty his power is, his force that is working on the inside of us. Why do we want to do the things that we do? You know, we're doing it because there's an internal force. It's the God in you, whispering in your spirit, uploading in your mind the amazing things that he's going to empower you to do in days to come. We are all kingdom builders. We are advancing the kingdom, and we need to be like Cush to understand that if God gives us a vision, we can do it. You can defy the odds. You should not be um, in love with the status quo. We should have a hatred towards the status quo. You should not be a person who allows themselves to be molded by the world. The Bible said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And once you have the mind of Christ, you will be individuals that really shape how we do life. Like Noah, we will hit reset buttons. We will change how we do life. And it's going to be the power that works in us. There's the scripture that goes on, which he wrought uh, in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above principalities and powers. Now, this, this, this is an, a, a, a few other words, which he wrought. That's another power. Um, it's anergon again, which he wrought in Christ Jesus and drop all the way down where he says that he raised him far above principalities and powers. That's another word for uh, uh, prince, uh, far above principalities. That's that word, RK, RK. It means the chain of authority, far above principalities and power. The word power is exousia, and that stands for authority. So let's look at the chain of authority. Ephesians 6, 12, and 13. In other words, if you're high up on the chain, you have more power, and the lower down you go, it means that now you have delegated authority. So all power is given by God. So all the power that is on the earth actually comes from God, and he just shares that power with, ch with, with his children. From government, government is, is, is a power, to giftings, giftings is a power, to the anointing. This is what God has given us so that we can function at the highest level of our potential, so that the orientation that we hold towards ourselves makes a difference when we show up in the world. We see that we are contributors to the pain in the world as well as the pleasure, to the progress in the world as well as the stagnation. And so if I become productive and successful, and that's my orientation in this world, inevitably, I'm helping the world to become productive as well as successful. If I'm progressing, say for instance, in the area of faith, in the area of righteousness, and my orientation towards myself is going to affect the orientation that I have in this world. And that's why we live in a very fragile social ecosystem that has to be honored, respected. It has to be nurtured, nourished, pro um, prospered. And um, I remember reading in a newspaper article many, many years ago, they were trying to find solutions to world problems. And this is in England. They asked the question, hoping that there would be a lot of people that would answer, but they asked the question, what's wrong with this world? And there was only one response, and the response was, I am. So you are what's right with the world, and you are also what's wrong with the world. And when you allow God, the power of God, to work in you, it simply means that power would translate in your marriage, translate into your parenting, translate into your communities, your families, your industry. So it starts with you. It starts with me, me as an individual. It is the parable of the snowflakes. How many snowflakes does it take to create an avalanche? And of course, the answer is one, and that's the last one. So you might be the catalyst 
that creates a tipping point in this world where we have moral leaders, leadership and ethical leadership. And this is what we're crying out for, we're praying for, we're believing for, we're believing that the gaps and the deserts that we're experiencing, that God will send water in the desert, that those dry places will bloom again. Where, wherever there's a need, God will be able to send us to meet that need. And he's gonna give us the power, the effectiveness, that when we show up, we're showing up in the chain of authority, knowing that God is, has given us power and it's delegated power. It's not coming from us, it's coming from God. And if you can resist God, that means you can resist us. But if you cannot resist God and his power, when God empowers you, it'll make you irresistible. Talking about the chain of authority, this is Ephesians 6, 12 to 13, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand the evil, it would stand in the evil days and having done all, stand. This is very, very powerful. It's very, very um, meaningful knowing that if the kingdom of darkness has rank and order, so does the kingdom of light. We have authority, but there's also a chain of command. Of course, the captain of this army happens to be Jesus Christ. He said, I'm going to give you, you know, uh, th this, this ability to work effectively under a chain of command. And then he says, you know, which he wrought in Christ Jesus, which he raised from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heavenly paces, far above principalities and powers. That's that word exousia, it's authority. So that word um, far above uh, of, uh, principalities as well as far above power. And again, that, that word is not uh, there, is not chain of authority, but it's the authority. So Luke 10 and 19, we all know this scripture, but it says, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So that's that word, exousia. Um, I give you authority over all the ability, that word power, over all the ability of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He said then, there's another Greek word. He said, and might, and that word might comes from a Greek word, dunamis, which is kinetic energy, and we went through this again. But First Chronicles 29, 29 to 30, I love uh, the stories of Solomon and David we're looking at this kinetic, kinetic energy again, this dunamis, this power. It reads, now the acts of David, the king, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel, the seer, in the book of Nathan, the prophet, and in the book of Gad, the seer, with all his reign and his might, and the times that went over him, and over Israel, and over all the kingdoms of the countries. And, and, um, and every name, you know, he, here, excuse me, I was jumping into my next text, but it says that he reigned and his might and the times that went over him and over Israel and over all the kingdoms of the country. So he reigned with so much energy. Have you ever seen a two-year-old? They have so much energy that they make you tired. Well, that is kinetic energy as well. It's not just the influence that God will give you that makes you irresistible. It simply means that you're working along with that to advance a project, a vision, to bring something to pass, and you never run out of power. You never run out of steam. And I'm decreeing and declaring, even if you feel weary, I decree that God is giving you your second wind and you're going to run with this, with this energy. And you're going to, the years that the palm worm, canker worm, caterpillar will destroy, God said, I'm gonna restore those years. So this is a season of second chances. Doors that were closed last season, they're gonna be open. And you're gonna to have to use your energy to get there. And when you show up, you've gotta own the space. You gotta own the room. And you cannot be a wallflower waiting for things to happen. 
you are going to make things happen and you're going to do it by the power of God. Bringing this to, you know, a close in terms of the Greek, it says, and dominion and every name that is named, um, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Dominion, curiotatos, curiotatos, and it means rulership. So when God said to humanity in the book of Genesis, let us create men in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion, that is that word, let them dominate, give them rulership, let them legally um, uh, have authority over a particular sphere. So as Paul was praying this prayer, and I'm hoping that you got an understanding of all those Greek words, the seven Greek words that we were using. As he was praying that prayer, he asks, he asks God to empower every believer. And I thought it was interesting because he not only had a, a prayer of thanksgiving, but he was had a prayer of intercession. He was interceding, and it could have been a prayer of petition where he was petitioning God, but also interceding on behalf of us and asking God through petition that he would empower us and we would have a revelation of how powerful we really are. And this is my prayer. My prayer is that you will have a revelation of how powerful you really are and you will have an understanding of over 150 dimensions of power that you have access to, that you can activate, that will change your life. Over 150 dimensions. And so when someone says that you're powerful, you want to know in which one of those realms you are pitching in. And imagine you showing up knowing that this, the spiritual realm is superior to the natural. Can you imagine if you had a revelation and an understanding and an acceptance and you really walked out the prayer that Paul was praying for each one of us as the church and you walked it out, you lived it, you believed it, you behaved it. Can you imagine how your life would change, how your marriage would change, how your ministry would change? You are not waiting for someone to power, empower you because God said that, behold, I give you power. And not just power for your life and power in business, power over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt or harm you. I grew up in abject poverty and therefore in so many areas, I felt powerless, uh, but when I, when, when I get, got saved at 17, the eyes of my understanding opened, and within a year of me getting saved, we moved from a rat-infested home that rained, when it rained outside, it rained inside, to a beachfront property, and that was within the first year of me being saved. Once I understood that I had power over poverty. I put my foot down and it affected not only my trajectory, but the trajectory of my entire family. I was the first one saved. And so many of us are carrying the weight and the burden of members of our family. And unless you operate in this powerful dimension and in these powerful realms of power, powerful rounds of power, uh, then 10 years, 15 years from now, your family's trajectory will pretty much look the same as it does now. But if you ever had the faith as well as the courage to believe that God has made you powerful and that it's within your ability to make a difference in this world, I can tell you this world would be a better place. I am the answer to my prayers, but so are you. Paul prayed, and I think that if we can continue to hammer this in, he made a simple prayer, and this text is still impacting us today, thousands of years later. I recognize from the text, from our text, from out of the book of Ephesians chapter 1, that prayer takes you into extraordinary realms of power. So write this down. Take this as a note. Your place of prayer is your place of power. It is, it, is, it is God's way of allowing us to tap into a fresh supply of power. Luke 10, 19 to 20, we read it earlier. I want to read it again. 
Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice that Rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your name is written in heaven. I mean, it's almost like Jesus was saying to the disciples, it's a given. If you're in the kingdom, then you're in a kingdom of power and you're going to live powerfully. You're not going to live with intimidation, consternation, with, with fear and worry. Because once you realize that you have power over all the power of the enemy, and you're able to exercise it, you're able to believe it, behave it, become it, you will literally see everything and everyone around you shifting to accommodate that revelation. So receive this revelation. Samuel Chadwick said, the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from powerless um, studies, from prayerless work, and from prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. So write this down. My place of prayer is my place of power. If, if, if um, Paul could find it necessary to petition God through prayer, that you and I would have a revelation and insight into how powerful we really are and how powerful the kingdom is, we know without a shadow of a doubt that prayer works. Your place of prayer is your place of power. R.A. Torre says, we are too busy to pray, and so we are too busy to have power. We have a great deal of activity, but we accomplish little, many services, but few conversations, much machinery, but few results. Wow. I mean, that's an indictment against the church. Martin Luther said, to be a Christian with, without prayer is no more possible than to be, be, be alive without breathing. And so if you are a Christian and you want to live a more powerful life, you've got to pray. Write this down. Little prayer, little power. More prayer, more power. Much prayer, much power. Why? Because prayer is a kingdom technology. And in the book of Luke chapter 11 and 1, the disciples was interested in effective prayer and they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. They didn't, they didn't say, teach us how to preach. They said, teach us how to pray. They didn't say, teach us how to prophesy. They said, teach us how to pray. And so it's interesting that when we read the book of Luke, Jesus teaches them about this technology he said, when you pray, say. So what is a technology? A technology is a methodology and materials used to receive a specific outcome. It could be commercially, industrially, industrially it could be governmentally, but there's some ad object that you need to um, achieve, but it takes less human energy to achieve that. That is what a um, technology is. So we're living in a technologically driven age. Everything is about technology. And so it is in the, in the spiritual as it is in the natural. We have natural technology, but we also have kingdom technology as well. And the kingdom technology, if I were to tell you this, is a conglomeration of all the practical, pragmatic, universal, spiritual principles that are industry specific, like apostolic, prophetic, didactic, pastoral, um, evangel and evangelistic, medical, scientific, which when applied affects positive change in the world, in the world's market, in the world's marketplaces, in social structures, in institutions, and in infrastructure, it makes a difference. And you, you have to understand prayer is a kingdom technology, just like technologies um, make human activities irrelevant. So it is when it comes to prayer. Prayer puts you in a position where heaven 
conspires with earth, where God conspires with angels to bring about a solution, whether it's healing or delivering, that is miraculous in nature. And so when we talk about the whole idea of prayer being a technology, we have to have Daniels and Josephs. They were architects, they were prophetic architects, and Ruth and Esther. You have these prophetic architects and David, prophetic architects. Prayer is like an architect and who, who, who creates global economies and channels uh, and, and avenues for wealth creation and wealth distribution and um, acquisition and advancement and proliferation of intellectual properties that enhances human development. And it, it prayer helps you to acquire real estate and it gives you global distribution channels, prayer. I mean, I can go on and on about prayer being a kingdom technology. And this is what Paul was using for us to understand that, that um, power is so dynamic, it's not just one type of power, it's many types of power. And God has to give you the revelation. You do that once you understand that, that, that you live in a powerful kingdom and how powerful prayer is. Prayer is this immutable spiritual force that exerts and exercises this continuous, decisive influence on both the natural and the spiritual world. It affects changes within kingdoms, institutions, within people, within in industries, within uh, current generations and future generations. Prayer shapes the world. Prayer shapes our destiny. E.M. Bounds said, the more prayer there is in the world, the better the world will be, the mightier the forces against evil. So we cannot just pray against evil. We've got to see ourselves as the answer to prayer. And if you look at prayer as an immutable, irresistible force, you have to see it as a law. Just like there's the law of gravity, there's a law called prayer, and the Bible said, man ought always pray. It's a law, it's a kingdom law. Why? Because 1 John 3, 22 to 23 is right. And whatsoever we ask, we, we, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of the son of, of, of Jesus Christ and love one another. And he gave us commandment. And so James uh, just supports everything that I was, was just saying, that we need, we need to use this kingdom technology of prayer because your place of prayer is your place of power. And little prayer, little power, more prayer, more power, much prayer, much power. And we want to get to a place where we're exercising our, uh, our rights in the kingdom, and we exercise it because of the power that God has given us. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21, now unto him who is able to do the exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So there's a power that works in us. When you find your place of prayer that turns that, that, that power on, it releases the power. All we need is is a spark to start a flame. And once we show up that powerfully, we will become unstoppable. So it's all Greek to me. When we talk about those seven, uh, it's actually nine, but the seven that comes out of Ephesians chapter one, you will begin to understand how powerful we really are. There are myriad of dimensions and realms of power and as we progress through the 21st century, knowing how powerful we are is going to be a, it's going to be the, the deciding factor on who wins and who loses. And if we show up powerfully, knowing that we have been empowered by Jesus Christ himself and we live in a kingdom of power, I believe 
that the world would change and come into alignment with God's original plan and purpose. Please write this down. I am powerful beyond my ability to comprehend. I am powerful beyond my ability to comprehend. Here's to a decade, a lifetime of showing up powerfully in Jesus' name. I hope you got something out of that. It's all Greek to me. God bless you all in Jesus' name. Our Father and our God, we pray that you would continue to bless us as we excavate the whole idea of power. Most people feel powerless. They had the, the, the wind knocked out of their sail. They've had below the belt ex experiences and blows to their personhood, to their faith, to their identity. But I pray this series of all series will cause them to rise up and take their rightful place of power in this world. The world is looking for leadership. The world is looking for direction. And we are the lights in this world. We are a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. And Father, we thank you that you are empowering us to let our light so shine before man that man will give, that man will see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I hope today's message gave you just a bit of insight into how great you really are. And it doesn't have to be Greek to you. Allow the Holy Spirit to whisper to your spirit and enable you to do things you thought that was impossible. But now you have the revelation that you not only have the power to do it, you are destined to do it. Thank you so much for viewing and following us over the years. Empowered TV is listener and viewer supported. And to all our wonderful partners, the partners of Sydney Trim Ministry, those who have helped us impact the lives of so many others around the world, we say thank you. We invite those of you who have not partnered with us to become a global empowerment partner right now. The work that God has called our ministry to accomplish takes a team effort. Together, we are reaching people around the world and we're impacting communities all for the glory of God. If you believe that God is using this ministry to impact the world with the message of the kingdom, join us in reaching others by partnering today. You can give at cindytrimministries.org slash give or by downloading the Cindy Trim app and selecting Give. There, you will find previously recorded teachings that will empower and inspire you to live your best life in Christ. As always, it's a pleasure and an honor to do life with you in real time. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like and share this teaching with a friend. Until next time, God bless you. Have you heard about the Cindy Trim Ministries app? This is where you can dive into our world of ministry. Just update or download the latest version of the app for free in the Apple or Google Play Store. On the dynamic home screen, you will continuously be up to date with the latest news, empowering teachings, and live streaming services. Become the leader you were born to be and establish your own empowered life group as you watch on-demand messages and access free discussion guides for each message. There's more empowerment at every click. Engage in the latest event hosted by Dr. Trim and find out when she's going to be in a city near you. Giving is easy. Donate now by selecting the Give button inside of the app. Download the Cindy Trim Ministries app now and begin your journey of empowerment with us today. Thank you.